I'm ready. Good morning. A beautiful day uh, for some people on the East Coast snowed in. For all of us, you know, getting through the the days that will be remembered <laughs> for for many many stories to come about 2020. But it's a uh, it's a season of giving. It's a season of reflecting. It's a season of of connecting and communicating around what we care about most. So it's a big privilege. My name is Uri Schneider. I lead Schneider Speech, and I really, really have goosebumps. The, the pleasure to host this conversation with Barry Yeoman. Uh, so thank you, Barry, for taking the time. I'll spare the long intro, but Barry is a person who, as a professional journalist, freelancer, teacher in both Wake, Wake Forest as well as Duke, um, just an extraordinary human being and his journey with stuttering and knowing it from the inside. Uh, we had a wonderful conversation two days ago. We thought we'd get on for a few minutes as often is the custom ended up being much longer. Uh, there's so much to learn, so much to share. And I'm so grateful that in your schedule, took the time to have this conversation, Barry, thank you. We're, uh, really happy that I'm here, Uri, and uh, thank you so much for having me. Wonderful. So as we said, it's, it's an unscripted thing. What would you feel, you know, you'd like people to know about you that feels significant in sharing? Wow. Well, you know, it's, it's hard to separate out uh, my story, your story, everyone's story from the fact that it's 2020, right? And I think that for many of us, certainly for me, um, this has been a year of figuring out what matters, what's, what's important. And it feels like that has come at a moment where I've been, I've been thinking about stuttering in new ways um, uh, with, with a big boost from a lot of people around me who are thinking original thoughts that I'm um, stealing and and trying to integrate in to my own uh, 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 under, under, under understanding about my stutter. And maybe we start with the end and we work backward, which is that after after a lot of years of um, first thinking of my stutter as a curse and then thinking of my stutter as a benign thing that I live with, and then thinking about my stutter as um, a benign thing that I live with proudly, I'm coming to think of my stuttering as a blessing. And mm -hmm. that is, it's head spinning. And it's really a realization that I've only fully come to in the last, I don't know, couple of years. So we had that conversation on the phone just about that idea of the lifespan perspective. And I know we both uh, love and enjoy and, and certainly you have participated many times. I have had the privilege as well. My father, wonderful Stutter Talk podcast. If anyone has not discovered that yet, uh, whether you're a professional, whether you're a person who stutters or someone who cares about stuttering, it is a premier you know, resource of conversations, over 700 conversations with people who stutter from around the world, researchers, professionals, thought leaders, and new new faces in the crowd. Um, so the thought about you, Barry, you know, as someone that people turn to almost as an elder statesman in the stuttering community, and when you shared what you just shared, uh, I just wanted to highlight that idea of that evolution and I think a lot of people five years ago, 10 years ago, could have looked at Barry Yeoman as he's arrived. Mm. He's at the destination. Could you share a little more about, about that evolution that you were describing and kind of like the stages of life and what it makes you think going back, as you said, if I knew then what I know now, the kinds of messages that may have been helpful and at the same time may have been incomprehensible at an earlier stage. Yeah. Um... And if I and, and 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 I look at myself ten years ago when I had definitely not arrived and 
and I don't think I've arrived yet. I think I'm just at another point in the journey, right? Um, so I, I, I grew up um, in a high achieving community uh, in New York State um, where a good portion of my high school class was Ivy League bound and there were certain expectations of achievement put on us by, by our peers, by our teachers, by our families, um, that that was about accomplishment, was about transcendence of the last generations, um, and was about metrics. Um, everybody not only knew their own SAT scores, but knew everybody else's SAT scores. And so what was measurable was what was important. Um, I can tell you how fast I could run the quarter mile. I could tell you how many pull-ups I could do. Um, uh, I could tell you what my differential aptitude scores were in eighth grade and um, that they told me that I should be a journalist, and if not a journalist, a playground attendant. Um, and so there was this huge honking metric, which is how many words I could get out of my mouth in a minute. And by that metric, I failed. I stuttered more, more severely than I do now, uh, a lot more. Um, I found recently a cassette tape of an interview I did, uh, when I was 20 and it was, it was a hot mess. Um, a, a lot, lots of struggle, lots of self-consciousness. Um, and, and so th that was the standard of my, my community, of myself and of the speech therapist I went to. Uh, how fluent were you? And that, that continued all the way through my last day of speech therapy into my 20s. Um, like a lot of New Yorkers in my generation, I went to see Dr. Martin Schwartz, whose book Stuttering Solved claimed that if you altered the way you, your, your air your airflow happened that you had a 94% chance of succeeding at fluency and I didn't succeed. Um, and so finally at 27, I said, screw this. And I quit speech therapy. And I've got, I've got a copy of my records from that speech therapy, which, which talk about what a, frustrated, resistant, hostile patient I was. Um, I was fluent in the therapy room and I was putting a lot of pressure on myself outside the therapy room to match that. And when I didn't match that, it snowballed. Uh, it, it, um, it, it added to my stress and I stuttered more and felt more frustrated. Can I interject or would yeah. it take you off course? No, please, please do. There's a question that I always ask someone when I meet them and, and some, it's more often the case that I meet people who've already been through some sort of experience with speech therapy. Um, and I have two questions I'd like to ask. And one is, what was the least helpful, most unpleasant part? And then what was one thing that you learned along the way, whether it was from that therapist or on your own or from a peer or a parent or some caring adult, who knows? Um, so in, 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 in the totality of the experience, what would you say was, was maybe one positive nugget that you picked up along the way, even if it was to realize something in yourself? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and what was maybe the most outstanding frustration? Because I think oh, it's helpful to- Yeah, well, I'll start with, 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 the, with, with, a, with a positive nugget because it, it, was, it was enormous, which was that my first speech therapist told me how to, to deal with bullies. And mm -hmm. 
it was brilliant. Uh, there was a kid who mocked my stutter every day. Uh, it made me frustrated and angry and sad and lonely. And my speech therapist said, why don't you pretend he's auditioning to be you in a movie and tell him how good his performance is? Which, which seemed crazy, right? But I was desperate and so I did, I did exactly that. <laughs> to no effect the first day. And then he came back the next day and he mocked me and I said the same thing and he stopped and said, really? And the third day he came and wanted to, to, to be my friend. And that was already the first time I felt like I had power as someone who stuttered. I How was old were like, you at that time? I was like 10, maybe. Um, wow. But it felt, it felt fierce. And um, that was, that was like, that, that, that was the high moment of almost 20 years of therapy. Wow. Um, I think that like all the techniques I taught were kind of equally effective or ineffective. Um, and, and I acquired a bag of tools that I still use um, in kind of a light way to get me through hard days. I know how to make sure that my air doesn't stop flowing. I know how to, um, how to cancel and repeat words and, and how to slow down and all that stuff. Um, but I think that the hardest part, the least useful was when I was actually measured, when, when a therapist decided that my measure of success was to bring me out into the wild and take a stopwatch to me. And it's so interesting that that was what you led with in terms of the culture that you were surrounded by growing up was, was about measuring, measuring up yeah. Certainly in my high school years, I was, and, and many of my years grew up with, let's just say most of my colleague friends are not speech therapists. Um, but there was a, you know, that just wasn't, you know, it was doctors and lawyers and brokers and investment banking. Um, but the idea that being measured, I think for anybody, right, is a feeling of being judged yeah. by someone else for your worth and your performance is up to speed or it's not up to snuff. But then if you're living in a world or in a home, anyone, I'm not speaking about any individual, but any, anyone is living with that, they're all the more sensitive to it and trying to find their worth and their, their place and their way. Yeah. And I should be clear, I bought into measuring culture completely. I, I, Are I, you still in? Less so, less so. Yeah, much so less how, so. how did that evolve? Talk about when did that switch happen? What, what years? Oh, God, you know, probably about the time that I quit speech therapy was about the exact same time that my friend started to die of AIDS. And nothing recalibrates you faster than uh, losing people you love. Um, I quit speech therapy at 27. My first friend died of AIDS when I was 28. And uh, so it, so those two, uh, it's, it's interesting that you asked that because I never made that connection in terms of time until right now, but it was within a year. And so there was this period, there was, there was a five year period between my quitting speech therapy and my finding the stuttering self-help movement. And those five years were the apex years for losing friends. And so I went through this 
huge recalibration um, period. Now, I was already on that path because what, like you became a speech therapist, I became a journalist, you know, we, we were both downwardly, downwardly mobile in relationship to our, to, to our communities of, of birth. But I'm honored. I'm honored to have any any kind of association or, or similarity with you. Thank you. Um, so I was already starting on that journey. I I was I was taking low paying jobs that were satisfying. So, you know, basically, as soon as I was out of college, I stopped thinking about the metrics. But I really stopped when um, these friendships I had developed in my adult life came crashing to a halt as people die. Um, and so I was really primed when I discovered the stuttering self-help movement in the form of what was then called the National Stuttering Project, the precursor to the current National Stuttering Association. And the very first gathering I went to was an international conference in San Francisco. So it's 1992, I'm 32 years old. I walk into this room with hundreds of people from around the world. And not only is it the first time I've been in a room with more than one other person who stuttered, but they were so cool. They were funny and they were good looking and they were accomplished and they were warm. And, um, and many of them seemed a lot less hung up about their stutter than I was. And I, could, I can tell you the night it all changed. It was, dur it was during that conference. Um, uh, I've thought about this recently when I um, when I spoke to two friends, uh, the 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 Association of Young People Who Stutter, uh, and you know there was all this great stuff that happened at the conference. But one night, eight of us ditched the conference. This was in San Francisco. Um, eight of us left, and we went to to the the the, uh, uh, the Mission District which um, was and is a largely uh, uh, Latino neighborhood in San Francisco. And we went to eat Salvadoran food. And there were eight of us, four Germans and two Poles and, and one, one other American and me. That's and like the beginning of a joke. I know, I know. Uh, well, well, just to, to, to a pile on and a server who didn't speak English, um, who was so freaked out by our stutters that she made us prepay our meal. Um, but we didn't care because we, uh, we kept ordering cuckooses and um, I wanna say sangria and we were eating and drinking and one of the Poles didn't really speak English. So the other Pole translated for him. And we were talking about things like what it was like to be in Germany when the wall fell. And we weren't talking about stuttering though Lord knows we were stuttering. And, and it felt so normal and so alive. And no one was hovering over with a stopwatch or telling us we had overstayed our 45 minutes or, um, or anything. It was pure light. It was pure warmth uh you described that as the night it all changed and and it consisted of a group of international people who stutter yeah who didn't 
have uh, a pre-existing friendship, right? Uh, but but connected at a conference, ditched the conference. Anyone that knows conferences knows the real magic happens between the sessions or when you step outside. Yeah. Not to say the sessions are not amazing, but uh, and when you describe it, you talk about just having conversations about current events and, and things in the world and things you cared about. It wasn't talking about the in, inner workings of stuttering and figuring it out and how do you manage and how do you cope and why do you think you stutter but connecting with these people and the carefree warmth and the flow and the feeling that there wasn't a stopwatch hovering i'm wondering in contrast to what in other words besides measured by you know speech therapists at times this experience was you're describing it as the night everything changed and in some ways it sounds so laissez-faire it sounds so so casual so matter of fact everyday daily life for so many people but i wonder what was different about it that felt so significant when you grow up with your primary communal goal being achievement um you don't particularly place value on on the times you can figuratively or literally lie on your back and stare at the ceiling. You, you, you don't necessarily value human connection as primary. I always had really close friends. I always understood the value of friendship, but the, but the voice was always pushing me toward achievement, even, even though I had gotten off the, the track that where I was supposed to be, you know, a doctor, a lawyer, or a stockbroker. Um, and so it, it would be many years still before I would realize that the accumulation of people who stutter in my life, um, many of whom are my closest, closest friends, were the biggest part of my life treasure. Or my, all, all my friends uh, 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 are the biggest part of my life treasure and people who stutter are a large subset of that, that if the people who stutter, who are in my inner, inner circle, um, were not there, I would be impoverished. And if I didn't stutter, they would not be there because I would never have met them. Um, that started with that night. Uh, the, 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 the seed was planted that night. I didn't know what the, what the tree would look like. Um, many fruits. Yeah, yeah. You, 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 you know, there are, there are two people from that initial weekend that remain uh, two of my closest friends and that's going on 30 years now. Wow. Well, I can't help but, uh, have shivers, you know, um, and I know many people you asked not to be distracted by which of your friends are here, but many people are enjoying the words you're sharing. And if you feel these are words worth sharing, uh, for no purpose other than the fact that I think part of why Barry carved the time was that I think this conversation could enrich the lives of other people who are on that journey and in some ways may resonate with something here or it may spark a question or a thought and uh, it may take them to another conversation. So if you feel inclined to share or to comment, I will try to monitor those comments and certainly appreciate the sharing of this conversation and, and Barry's wisdom and the treasure that is this this moment right here. So thank you to everybody that's here. Uh, thank you. Thank you for that, for that, for, for, for those words too. Marie.
hundred um, percent. I, I I truly it's not I I try not to share more than I should, but I get I get private comments from people. This is the most touching thing about these conversations, and what's made it worth the effort to keep it up is people who are students of speech pathology, people who are people who stutter, who are wondering about becoming professionals in this field as researchers, as clinicians, and people who stutter around the world far and wide. And they talk about the feeling of access to people like you, Barry, people mm -hmm. like Michael Sugarman, people like Jerry Maguire, people like Vivian Siskin, then everyone in between, um, each and every person, whether it's a person who's a better known name or a lesser known name, each person has a story and the purpose of what we're doing here is really just sharing these stories um, and uh, giving people access. I, I'm I'm obsessed with that. The idea that you know the world has always been a place where people have access. There are the haves, the have-nots. Whether it's geographic, whether it's uh, monetary, and if we can create bridges, so that, that's my little soapbox there. But um, there are many people that are enjoying, and and please continue to enjoy and to share. So Barry, I couldn't help but notice it, it's striking how the experience you had is within the context of, of a trajectory of your life. And so like finding your independence and getting out of that, what you said, being bought into, bought into the metric system and, and measuring things and measuring by achievement. So that shift was happening. Do you think that night could have happened? Do you think you could have gone to that conference at the age of 15? Oh, the age of 20. Could you share um, on that? Because I think I think it's it's so powerful. We all know that people that go to conferences sometimes have such watershed experiences. Many people that have good experiences, it is a watershed moment. And at the same time, there's there's this hope that we could get everyone to have that moment if we could just get them to come into that room. Right. And some people are resistant. And I was wondering yeah. if you could share on that, being someone who had such an experience, but also the perspective of what your readiness was. Oh, I think I would have been completely resistant earlier. Um, but that said, if you had dragged me into the room and I, I've always been somebody who hurries to make connections. Um, I, I, I remember, I was 15 and my family went to Disney World. And um, when we were coming home, um, the airport in New York was snowed in. And so they, they canceled our flight and, and um, put, uh, put us up at, at an airport hotel. And like I beelined to the nearest 15-year-old uh, uh, male I could see and just had a conversation um, and looked him up later, you know? Um, and so, so I think if you had gotten me in the room, I would have, I would have been beelining to somebody who felt safe. Uh, and while I might've been resistant to the message that it's okay to stutter. It may even be cool to stutter. Um, I would have been open to the, the human contact. And, and so that's my hope. I mean, we have all of these eight-year-olds, 10-year-olds, 18-year-olds who are coming in to friends now who, um, who, I don't know if they're coming voluntarily um, at first, uh, if they're thinking that this is gonna be something that fixes their stutter, but you see what happens when, when young people show up at any self-help organization conference, um, when, when kids go to, say, um, start acting uh, on a stage. Uh, the, the hope is that whatever expectations you had going in or whatever reticence you had going in, you shed. 
and I think I would have had a lot of reticence going in earlier in my life. And regardless of whether I had shed, I would have shed the have to fix my stutter attitude. I would have been open to the relationships. Picking up on that, one of the other questions I often ask that eight-year-old that may be brought into our office, my father always says, they usually are not the ones that picked up the phone and uh, scheduled the appointment, you know? Right. So I say, you know, whether they're eight or 18, um, did you come here because you wanted to or your parents kind of schlepped you in? And, and if it's the former or the latter, I'm interested in what, what drew you here? What was the attraction or what was the hope and then what was the resistance? What were the things you might've been concerned of? What are some things, you know, you and I talked about the idea that um, creating space and permission for different people to have um, different experiences and different feelings and, and resistance. I was wondering if you could just share on that. In other words, the younger Barry, as you said, you might've gotten there and made some really meaningful connections, even if you might've verbally resisted going originally. But then of course, there may have been something that you might have been encouraged to do or pushed to do that might have pushed a button that would have actually soured it for you. Yeah. And and while the overwhelming majority of young people who participate, and I can't emphasize or amplify enough the value and importance of young people, especially, but all people feeling a part of something bigger than themselves, not feeling like you're alone, no matter what you're living with. So self-help community is so, so incredibly valuable. And at the same time, as with anything powerful in life, it doesn't come without people that have a different experience or an aversive reaction. Uh, it doesn't mean that the community is not a good community, but creating that space so fewer people's buttons get pushed, but the space is there to have a positive experience, whatever you're ready for. Do you have any insight on that? The younger yeah. Barry or young kids that you see and you're so involved, what are your thoughts about that in terms of how do we create an open space, even within self-help, where people that are still resistant can be in the tent, even with yeah. that resistance? That's a great question. And I would expand that to say young adults and older adults. It's, it's not just kids. Um, we've been talking about that a lot among ourselves uh, in my little posse of stuttering friends. Um, because um, when you find yourself having reached an epiphany, you, you tend to become militant about it. Um, no, no more militant non-smoker than an ex-smoker, right? Um, and so there are moments when I just want to burn down the house. I, I, I like, like every, every bad attitude about stuttering that I define as bad. <laughs> I, I want to, I want to, I want to get rid of it. I, I, um, I don't have the patience for, um, for, for people who want clinical drug trials, to, you know, or, or, you know, what, 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 whatever it is. I, um, I, at my most, um, intransigent moments, I want to, you know, say my way is the right way. And, and, you know, you know, y'all come here. Um, and then I come to my senses and I remember that I am somebody for whom inclusion, diversity um, has teeth, it matters, it's something I actively work toward and that I can't be inconsistent here. That, um, that in fact, we want to create the biggest possible tent. And, you know, I, I think about, I think about something I, I heard Chris Constantino 
say recently, and I'm going to try to paraphrase and maybe butcher, but basically it was to the effect of that we are, if we are asking for the freedom to stop chasing fluency, then we should be granting freedom to those who still want to chase fluency. That, that we need to be consistent in our guiding principle, which is that there is no one path. There's no, there's no right way that everybody has to follow. That I might um, say that we, we, we live in an ableist society that has to accommodate us. It has to change. Um, we, have to, um, we have to work on the evil of ableism, the privileges, uh, fluent speech, all of which is true, I believe. Um, but that doesn't really help you if you're looking for a job at a restaurant. And, and regardless of what the law is or what you believe should be the case, um, you might get hired with a stutter, but you won't get hired with a severe stutter. And for those whose reality is that job market, who am I to say, um, stutter as much as you want, you know? you know, screw the bosses, uh, you know, that's, that's, that's a very privileged thing for me as a college educated white guy to say. Uh, this is such an important point, Barry, I want you to continue to go with it where you wish. I think it also speaks to our newly elected president mm. and the expectations of him Yeah, uh, and his identity as a, as a person who stutters and how that is shared versus how much that is not put front and center and how overtly he should stutter versus how acceptable it is that maybe he switches words and maybe he stuffs it in sometimes. Clearly, yeah. he's a person who stutters and still contends with his stutter. And the, the judgment and conversation around yeah. how he manages it, expectations, I think what you're talking about is right on that. Yeah. Um, as you know, I've written about uh, pre 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 President-elect Biden, and, and I um, was at that first National Stuttering Association um, conference where he spoke in 2004, and I challenged him during, during, during the, the Q&A because what he, he seemed to be saying at the time, and I think he's evolved since then, is that, that, that you can do anything you want as long as you apply yourself to uh, getting rid of your stutter like I did. And I asked him during the Q&A, are you saying that for a kid to succeed, they must stop stuttering? Um, or are you saying that um, a kid can, can, see, can succeed as an adult and stutter? And at the time he, he hedged, he, he said, well, well, of course anyone can, can succeed. You know, no, you know, no matter what, but he said, your, your ability to convey a message is gonna be limited by the listener's willingness to receive the message. Now, what I know is that Biden has evolved a little bit, but what I know even more is that Biden's message has been received in really helpful ways by a lot of people. And you just have to, to, to look at, at Braden Harrington, who spoke at the Democratic National Convention, who took that message, took inspiration from it, and then made it his own 
which was not the same as Joe Biden's message. Braden Harrington got up in front of the camera and in front of how many tens of millions of people stuttered openly. Something that his role model doesn't do. So even though President Biden um, gives one message, that doesn't mean that that message does, 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 doesn't evolve through the generations. Um, Joe Biden is in his late 70s. He came of age at a certain moment in the conversation about stuttering. He is not likely to evolve too much beyond where he is now, um, because that's what's, you know, that, you know, that, that's what made him president. He, he, um, he accomplished in spite of his stutter. Um, but you see the seed get transferred from Biden to Braden, and you see maybe the rootstock's the same, but the the fruit looks different. And then what will Braden Harrington transmit to, to the next generation? Um, and just that, just that transmission makes me want to be more inclusive. Um, let's, 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 let's not even talk about the people who come in at point A and we want to bring them to point Z, but maybe we bring them to point C. That's, that's something too. Um, maybe somebody never wants to stop working on fluency shaping, but they love themselves a little more and they feel like they have a better community structure, and maybe they, they, they don't beat themselves up quite so much. That's, that's sometimes that's is so, so important. And it goes back to the measure, right? And, and whether the achievement is the measure or whether it's being on the path and being in the dance and being on the journey and being engaged. I think I just wanted to riff off that and then take it where you want. I think there's also the idea of Joe Biden versus the president-elect Biden. Mm. There's the individual man, and then there's the man who is a politician. And by virtue of being a politician, you represent others and you represent the office, whether you're holding one office or another. And I think it's very striking the time he chose to take out of his schedule with more than 10 young people I know who stutter, that during the campaign, he would take more than 20 minutes to talk to Braden on the phone, mm. more than that's with others. That was the man. That was Joe Biden. That was Joe Biden who grew up with a stutter. And I think we don't hear that story or see that story as much because I think when we see him and hear him now in the position he's in, there's also that identity or that performance of the role he, the shoes he fills in that sense. And I think it's striking that he chose to have Braden, I think, as his proxy. Yeah. of maybe the personal Joe Biden, the real Joe Biden as an individual, that was a choice that didn't have to be made. It was a bold choice. And maybe maybe I'm wondering if it was a message and a model and having met John Hendrickson, of course, you know, maybe these were things that he chose in, in a subtle, indirect way to portray and bring out. Maybe we need to give more credit in that way. Maybe. Or maybe just like my childhood speech therapist told me that you, you diffuse a bully, he was diffusing a bully. He, um, he, he might have known that the next three months, there would be all these people on the other side making fun of his stutter and that the easiest way to diffuse it is to address it directly. Uh, and, and so 
um, he finds a really sympathetic way of, of addressing it directly. And I'm not, I'm not um, in any way saying that's a bad thing. I think, I think that in some ways, me telling the schoolyard bully who will not be named that he did a really good job of, of auditioning to play me in a movie. And suddenly the power of the bullying was diffused. Maybe Biden and his team decide, oh, yeah, they're, they're gonna, they're gonna mock my stutter. You know, let them try to mock Braden Harrington stutter. And, and so, so I wonder if he was in some ways doing the same thing that I did when I was 10. I'm gonna leave room for that. Mm -hmm. But I, I do wanna put forth that other possibility and it's based on my conversations with Braden and his family. And I think the interview with John Hendrickson mm -hmm. and the, as you said, the speeches that, that Biden gave at times when he was not a nominee. So right after he lost the Democratic nomination process uh, to Barack Obama, he was sort of not here, not there, you know, didn't have a campaign in action. And he spoke at the American Institute for Stuttering. And those videos where he tells his story are more open, more emotional, more, more gripping, in my opinion, than any other. And I think it's partially because he had the latitude. And so I think if one looked at the different statements that are made over his you know, trajectory of his career in different spaces, different audiences, I'd like to think that Braden Harrington wasn't uh, you know, a puppet of, of, uh, of a purpose or a function to deflect uh, the bully behavior. Uh, there could be that function as well, but I think in Braden, the same feeling that so many people saw, whether they stutter or not, the courage, the bravery, the openness. I think that I choose to think uh, without you know, making a case that I think that Joe Biden in his heart of hearts was equally enamored by Braden for being a young person who did things that many of us much older than him still couldn't do. Mm -hmm. To get up and speak and say what we have to say no matter how it comes out. And I just am in awe of that kiddo. Well, he is awesome. He is awesome. And yeah. It is very clear also that, um, that, that Joe Biden's affection for him is genuine and deep. Uh, what's, what, is, what is an interesting and open question for me is when, when, when president-elect Biden becomes President Biden um, and likely one-term President Biden, he's he'll be in his 80s in four years uh, and may not may not run for re-election who knows um, does that give him more latitude then to be more open be more of an advocate um, we already see not just his political adversaries but even journalists um, um, taking pot shots when, um, when he uh, botched, but then corrected the last name of the, his nominee for HHS secretary and some, some prominent journalists immediately tweeted out the, the mistake as if he had just given away the nuclear code. Um, At some point, he may decide that he's he's done. He's done stuffing any of it under his hat. That that he's not running again. That he's the president of the United States, and um, and um, that he's gonna be. Um, He's going to be forthright in talking about his stutter, and and 
you know, be more open about it than than he than he, he's, he, he ever ha has before. I think, and you just put on display. I I was well aware going into this that I'm speaking with a journalist of the highest order, so I'm out of my league and defer to you and, and a lot of what you just reflected is so profound and gives me a lot. I'll be listening to this again. I hope others will too. Can you talk about how a, a kid who stutters ends up in, a, in an industry, a profession, a career of teaching, of journalism, which is all about words and in some ways is uh, so fitting and in other ways so surprising? Yeah. So, I like to say that I feel like I popped out of the womb a journalist. I was, you know, I was publishing a neighborhood newspaper, handwritten with pencil at 11. Um, and I grew up in a community where being a journalist was not considered upward mobility and certainly got messages that that didn't make a lot of sense um, if you stuttered. and. And I, 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 was, I, was, I was editor of my high school paper. I was a good editor of my high school paper. Um, um, it, it, you know, ticked off our principal more than once. And also- it Seems like we have a lot more in common than we have found before. <laughs> you know? I spent more time outside the principal's office than I did in class. Yeah. I, I actually had the principal report me to the police when I would not divulge the name of a campus drug dealer who I had written about in the school paper. Um, so, so you didn't just give your speech therapist a hard time. You were an equal opportunity. Oh, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I not. Well, I, I, and it was this weird combination of um, being a good kid and being having an anti-authoritarian streak. Yeah, yeah, right there with you. Um, so, um, what's that? What's that verse from 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 First First, first Corinthians? You know, um, as a child, I did childish things, and then I put away the childish things. I thought, okay, I'm entering college, I'm entering adulthood, I'll do the adult thing, and I entered as a psych major, which lasted for three days. And then I went to a journalism department orientation at NYU. And I said, that's what I am, you know? And so again, I, I did this in my head thinking it was in spite of my stutter, that, that I've got this huge obstacle. I can't talk right but i really want to do this so i'm gonna i'm gonna you know you know be the track star with one leg you know um and it took a long time like into my 30s before i started to realize that my journalism oh, i'm sorry that my stutter actually made me a better journalist and it was a process, it was an accretion of realizations um, that first, I didn't particularly like my own voice, so I just knew how to shut up and listen. And, you know, early in my career, I, I, I worked for a weekly newspaper in North Carolina here, and I covered the state legislature. And I would be sitting in the press room and there were all these swaggering journalists who were telling stories and never listening as far as I could tell, but I wasn't doing that. I was just listening. And so stuttering makes me a better listener. And then I realized that stuttering makes me less intimidating. And so I show up at somebody's door and they're already nervous about talking to the journalist uh, and increasingly, you know, the accomplished journalist. And then I show up and I'm five foot six. No, I'm not, I'm five foot five and three quarters. Um, 
my, my shirt's wrinkled and I stutter. And so I become less intimidating. And so people open up more and people relate to I'm me. I'm already disadvantaged. I'm already disadvantaged. I'm six feet tall. Yeah. I don't stutter. Yeah. And, and I can't, and I can't stop the fact that it happens to be that the shirt is iron free. So it doesn't have wrinkles. <laughs> oh my, I, 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 even, even, even iron free shirts of mine wrinkled. It was like, it was like, I, I, I was, I, I was, I was, I was, I was, I was like, like pig pen on Charlie Brown. It would just, you know, start cleaning, just start walking. And yeah, you know, I, I would, I would be, 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 begin wrinkling through the day. Um, but 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 that kind of imperfection, um, it turns out, is really inviting, and so so people talk to me more. Um, I understood marginalization in a way that I might not have if I if I didn't stutter. And so when I, um, I mean, I will never know what it means to be black or to be an immigrant or to be transgender or to use a wheelchair. Um, and, and, and I don't wanna inject any false equivalencies, but I know what it's like to have people underestimate you and to have something that puts you at a disadvantage and so I tend to gravitate toward people like that rather than people in power. And I think that makes me a better journalist. So all of this was a really slow recognition, but I got there. And I mean, I still have um, shaky moments, um, but, um, but, by and large, I can hold on to that um, recognition that, God, um, I, you know, these days, I, every interview I do is recorded, um, at least audio, and more and more video because of the pandemic and Zoom, right, this. And so, I watch those recordings I, I, I'm transcribing or I'm looking for something and, and I, I hear the stutter, I see the secondaries, um, but what I don't see is me being a worse journalist for it. When I, when I meet people that are going into career or, or wondering if they could be a good partner in a significant relationship, uh, and there's this belief that, hey, if I stutter, how could I possibly be a good husband? How could I possibly be a good father? How could I possibly be a good journalist, lawyer, teacher, whatever? Um, I, I borrow from my father this idea, you ask them, Certainly that's, that's a story and that's a belief that you've been living with and you may have been messaged such a thing based on you know, other people's measures and expectations. But I wonder if you go out there and you ask the person that you're looking to couple up with or someone like them or the interviewer at that grad school or at that job interview, and you wonder what are the top five qualities they're looking for? What are the top five qualities of a journalist? And you'd probably have a bunch. You, you would know better than me. I'm not even gonna step there. But, but fluency probably isn't in the top five or top 10. Yeah. And, and as a person who stutters, how important it is to figure those things out and realize you might be average or above average in many of those. And if you go in just worrying about your stutter, managing your stutter, and even if you manage it, quote unquote, successfully, and you don't stutter, you don't stutter as well as much. Uh, you might fail to show them what they're really looking for, which is not how well you manage fluency, but how well you can do the job. Yeah, yeah. Um, it turns out there are a lot of journalists who stutter. Um, I, I, I know because I hear from them. Um, and I don't want to romanticize this. Um, I know that there are people who stutter who get turned down for jobs because of the stutter. Um, 
including jobs in journalism. I am one of them. <laughs> you know, I, 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 this was early in my career, but I had an editor um, call me, like ready to offer me a job even before interviewing me. And then he heard my stutter. And then he called back two days later and said, we're, we're actually like reconfiguring our staff. So we're not gonna hire for that job. And I said, it's the stutter. And he said, yes, uh, this is a job that's gonna be very visible in the community. We're hoping to break a lot of stories and the, 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 you know, the writer will probably be interviewed on television. Uh, and, but if you're ever in town, let's have a cup of coffee. Um, no, thank you. Um, so, so there is, there is the external reality that some employers are not going to hire people who have disabilities, uh, or people who, you know, who in any way defy their preconception of what a journalist is. But and with, yeah, I just but, wanted to, to yeah. Good. Um, after you. Okay, uh, but that, but, but, uh, but that is different from how you perform as a journalist. I, I wanted to just pull from you or challenge you to speak to those people, speak to those people who have those worries, who are anticipating that possibility or live with repeated experiences like that, being Barry Yeoman, being someone who's lived through that, being someone who's aware of it, and at the same time, being a person who encourages people to pursue the path that is their path and be resilient and be who you are and be truthful to your calling, what wisdom, what, what encouragement, what message might you give to someone who feels they've been um, precluded from access to a job or to a community or to a position based on their stutter? What would be your, because you said before also, railing against them for discrimination in some cases might be important self-advocacy, right. um, but it, at sometimes it might not be. Could you share something on that? You probably didn't want that job anyway. Um, being precluded from a job is different from being precluded from a career. And you should not assume that one means the other. Um, it will be harder because you stutter, because there are uh, ignorant and in some cases malicious people in the world. Um, but this country, this world is full of journalists who have, who stutter and the, the, the ingenuity that you bring to navigate past other people's discriminatory practices will in the long run strengthen you. Uh, it is hard to believe it in that moment. In that moment, it just hurts. And um, I don't wanna downplay that. Uh, you might feel weak. You might feel like a failure. And I don't wanna say, buck up, you know, um, but eventually buck up. And um, like, like, like not immediately, not immediately, you know, feel the feelings, but then recognize <laughs> my first editor, I will name him, James, James Edmonds, at the Times of Acadiana in Lafayette, Louisiana. He hired me for a job straight out of college. Uh, he was technically not my first editor because I had part-time uh, 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 sure, sure. journalism jobs, but, but my first- there, There's a journalist making sure he's on record and being accurate. That was it, beautiful. Yeah, a footnote, right. Um, but James called me and got me in a newsroom where I was basically freelancing in college. And he had like gotten my 
application to fill this job. He didn't know anything about me other than three newspaper clips I had sent and a resume. And he calls me and I stuttered severely on that call. And he later told me that when he hung up the phone, he thought to himself, that's the guy I want to hire because he did the work that I just read with a stutter. And that shows what kind of go-getter he is. And you only need one James because once you get the first James, then the dominoes of resistance start to fall. And what I, if there's one thing I could take from all these conversations, Barry, is that message. It seems that every person, and I think it extends also to people that don't stutter, but anyone that certainly has had any sort of adversity, someone opened a door. And just <laughs> opening that door one time, it, it opened a floodgate. You know, just crack, go, the Talmud says, you open the door for me, just a crack. I'll take it the rest of the way. We've all got to put in the effort to swing the door open, but someone's got to unlock it for us. Yeah. And if we're in the position, what I want to flip around, especially this time of year, giving and, and paying forward, if we're in a position to open a door for somebody, to recognize the power of that gift, and it could be nothing. It could be taking a phone call and giving someone our attention, our ear, our wisdom, our experience. It could be making a phone call or an introduction. It could be looking at a resume and, and just offering some feedback from the perspective that we have. We don't know the significance of that act, but it can be life-changing. And many of us have benefited from it. And we have to recognize we all have that chance to pay it forward. Thank you for that. I am bowled over by feedback I get about things that I don't even remember remember that I did. Uh, I'll run in to somebody who, you know, I taught seven years ago or who I had coffee with because they were thinking of a career in journalism or I, I wrote a letter of introduction and they'll say, um, you were the first person who ever told me I had talent. Um, you were the first person who ever introduced me to a future employer. Um, you know, you wrote me the letter that got me my first job and look where I am now. And at the time it really did, it did seem in, inconsequential to me, but it's not, it never is. Um, that's been, that's been such a, such a surprise. I remember the first time I put a hand on each shoulder of a student of mine and looked him in the eyes and said, do you know how proud I am of you? And that was scary for me because it was exercising my authority in a way that I hadn't done very often. But I saw I saw a change in that moment. And we know in education, people will perform up to the standard that you hold them to. Vivian Siskin talked about it with Joseph Sheehan, and I see that in life and practice so much. We're gonna wrap in just a few moments. I wanna give Barry the final word and chance to share the nuggets. He has so much to pour forth. I'm gonna share one quick story about resumes and jobs specifically, because it's just perfect for this moment, and then give Barry a chance to take us home for this conversation, this round. Um, a young man came to me, it was a young man, he finished college, he was a big athlete, big fine specimen of American athleticism and brains and an MBA student and a high level collegiate athlete. And he was networking on LinkedIn and uh, dealing with a lot of headhunters and things. And so we were talking about how to put his stuttering on the radar because picking up the phone or showing up for the interview, as Barry said, you know, it can look good on paper and then you get on the phone and you stutter and sometimes people don't know what to do with that. And sometimes the consequences are the difference between getting the job or not. And I'm a big believer, it's part of this transcending stuttering academy that we're working through, self-advocacy. How do we tell the story? And as Barry said, in a way that's not militant or adversarial, 
but is informative and creates bridges and creates confidence that people have in your ability and your integrity and your perseverance and that you're not intimidating. Uh, so I, I came up with an idea that this guy should put on his resume in his volunteerism that he volunteers as a mentor for other kids who stutter. And in that way, he's putting the stuttering on the table before he even gets on the phone or has the call with the headhunter. But it's totally non-apologetic. It's totally non-anything. It's turning it around into an asset. If I've lived through an experience of having a stutter and the, these are my accomplishments on the top section. And in my free time, I offer mentorship. That was a year ago, Barry. I met a young teenager who also plays lacrosse, same sport. He's a junior high kid on the East Coast and I'm working with him and he's got all kinds of worries about stuttering. And I tell him, you know, I think I have a mentor for you. I just haven't been in touch with him in about a year. The next day I get an email from Gary, the guy that I had met the year before. And I said, hey, and he tells me an update. And I said, how would you like to be a mentor? He says, I would love it. <laughs> I would love it. So I told him at the time, you could only put it on your resume if you truly do it. And whether it's through one of these organizations and he has joined the NSA programs and Friends has un wonderful programs, Say has wonderful programs, but the idea of giving back, you don't just give, you also get. So just want to encourage all of us in whatever way we can, whether it's monetarily, foundations and organizations need help, whether it's you know giving the time and attention or, or a message to a young person, it's so, so important, especially now. So Barry, this has been amazing. People are drinking it up. Take the time to just share whatever you'd like to just pack in here before we say good day. I think I do have just one more thing to say, which is, so earlier, Uri, you were talking about um, some of the giants in the stuttering world, you know, the Michael Sugarmans. Um, and so many of those folks um, gave to me. Um, at that very first self-help meeting with National Stuttering Project, you know, uh, John Albuck, um, who was executive director at NSP changed my life. Um, but I want to add that, that the, tr the, that the generational transfer runs in both directions. Um, I took a break from American stuttering self-help for a decade, um, from, from 2004, the year that I, asked Joe Biden that question until 2014, when I realized I missed my friends and I needed to come back. And I, and I had been to a couple of international conferences and I'm um, in that period, but I had not been to, to an American one. And when I came back, there was a new generation of thinkers. Um, uh, I think about people like Chris Constantino. Um, I think about, all the folks in the leadership of uh, 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 the, the New York City chapters of NSA uh, and uh, um, um, NYC stutters. Um, uh, next Russia. week, yeah, next week, Matthew Bernuka actually is joining me next Thursday. He yeah. co leads the Brooklyn chapter. Wonderful guy, yeah. as well as all the rest. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and in those first years, I came back, I met, you know, Roshin and Stavros and Emma and, and, Chaya and Mark and Mark. Um, Mark and, and Mark, Mark and Mark. Yeah. Um, and they were untainted by some of the uh, tensions that had gone on, you know, in schools of thought about, about how, <laughs> um, how, proactive people who stutter should be politically, how much we should involve uh, SLPs in shaping our mission, um, like all the stuff that uh, was a robust and sometimes tense conversation in the stuttering world, that was before them. And so they came in fresh and clean and with, with a set of ideas that, um, that I was so ready to hear. And th those really were the leap from it's okay to stutter to it's kind of great to stutter. And so when someone like 
like Chris Constantino talks about how stuttering makes us more vulnerable and that allows for more intimacy in our conversations, um, which is real, which is palpable. When, um, when somebody like Josh St. Pierre, um, historian in Canada, a co-founder of Did I Stutter, talks about how, um, st how stuttering um, moves us away from the measurable efficiency of modern life, you know, the, the industrial production standards of, of 21st century America and brings us back to more natural ways of measuring time, be it uh, agricultural cycles or lunar cycles or menstrual cycles. Um, when Emma Alpern writes about how stuttering can be exciting um, and like a type of dance where you know Fred Astaire trips, but then he doesn't fall. Yeah. All those ideas and more. Um, um, were so instrumental in helping me make the leap to this last phase, this most recent phase of my contemplation of stuttering. Um, that is wisdom I got not from the last generation, but from the one after me. And so, um, so I just wanna uh, thank those who came before me and those who have come after me because we all fuel each other in surprising and growthful ways. Wow. So just to riff off that, I wanna thank you. It's those that come before, those that come after and those of us that have the fortune to meet in the middle. Um, we, we gain from both sides. And uh, I think the message I'm taking, if I can just uh, say it in a, the way it comes through me, what you just shared, each of us individually are on a journey and growing. Um, we have to look back at those that set the groundwork for us and they have a lot that they've put in place that wouldn't be here, we wouldn't be benefiting from if not for their efforts and initiatives. And, and it doesn't go one way, right? It's a reverb, kind of goes both ways. And uh, that people like you tipping a hat to those who are now in positions of raising their voices and contributing to the community. So each of us is evolving, the community is evolving and the world is evolving. And the best way forward is when we recognize the contributions, both of those before us, those that stand with us and those that are maybe younger than us, but offer a fresh eyes and offer fresh new addition. There's nothing, it's not complete. There's, there's room to add your, your piece and your voice and we all have a piece to add. So that's stunning. Uh, um, amen. So thank you, everybody. I'll end it here. If you want to check out, I'll just make the plug. The next step of 2021, if you go to schneiderspeech.com slash TSA, as in Transcending Stuttering Academy, opportunities for speech therapists and for people who stutter to take it forward from these conversations. But thank you, Barry. I wish everyone stay healthy, stay strong, share the conversation, comments, likes, and I'm sure Barry and I will make our efforts to respond to the comments that we can. But we appreciate all of you and thank you for sharing the time with us.